नमस्ते एंड थैंक यू वेरी मच नमस्ते माया दुर्गा माया दुर्गा नमस्कार राइट माया इज वेरी नाइसली ड्रेस फॉर द शो एपिसोड नंबर 45 उत्सव है उसके बाद वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग टॉपिक वी हैव फॉर ऑल आवर व्यूअर्स टुडे I want to also remind everyone that we are uh, streaming in addition to uh, you know people who are watching us on the on our social media channel which is YouTube Facebook and Twitter we also come actually recorded I mean or recorded on Tag TV so last week was our first episode on Tag TV and we got a lot of traction within a few hours more than a thousand people had watched it and the number continues to grow so it's so that we have now now not only are we on uh, all the social media channels um, of our own of VHPA and uh, Hindu Pack but also on Tag TV YouTube channel and we are also on the Tag TV broadcast uh, set top box so it's so that with that um, today's topic is uh, Asian Americans near whited othered and then attacked and i will give you the background of that but before that i want to just mention that uh, this is a call in show and please we have a active chat group usually uh so i forgot to turn on this uh, music so let me turn it off um and i just want to remind you that uh, and everyone that this is a call in show so we welcome everyone to call in and participate in the conversation uh with that so that i uh, turn it over to you to welcome all our viewers today thank you everybody and uh, yes this is our 45th show so we have been on air for uh, a year now and uh, almost a year and uh, and this has been uh, been fantastic run and uh, thanks to you all we we are now on uh, tag tv as well and uh, we look forward to a fantastic show and this week's topic of uh, asian americans is a topic that is uh, that is not really discussed much and, uh, and 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 off late has been getting some news time not for good reasons so we thought we would uh, deconstruct some of the issues uh, concerning asian americans and some of the narratives that uh, are floating around uh, few of them are true few of them are false and, and quite a few of them are politically motivated so let me uh, go back to ajay bhai and uh, we have maya durga here uh, who usually has the as a deepest expert opinions in our conversation so uh, i give you back ajay bhai <laughs> right so so that this is an interesting uh, news item so i'm going to i'm going to share my screen and i'm going to uh, i'm going to see if uh, you or anyone else has any comments on this so so that this is a news item uh, this is a um, rather a uh, uh, a news a report that was done by uh, asian american and pacific islander a group that you know uh, uh that does these kinds of studies and advocacy actually for uh, it does advocacy for asian americans uh, which includes indians but it also includes the uh, you know people from uh, you know far east asia by including the chinese americans the vietnamese koreans uh, thailand philippines all asian american countries uh, including india and this report of sada said that the asian american anti asian hate crimes in the us increased by nearly 150% in 2020 and it's mostly in new york and los angeles but it's not limited to that uh, if you know if you read the news item the bullet some of the latest attacks happened even in uh places in like oakland they happened in houston they happened in san diego they happened in other places as well so uh, this caught the attention of uh, president biden and a lot of other politicians uh, uh the city of new york for example put in some money uh, to uh, do a, a city of los angeles are uh, putting some money to do research on this so i we are going to so that dive deeper into this because there is a interesting conundrum and we'll talk about that um that where do asian americans including indians fit in this uh, you know in this society and i think that um, that is something that uh, you know uh, 
uh, that is something that people have been trying to figure out for a, quite a while. So these are the these are the uh, some of the, the uh, uh, snippets of the NPR report, and it says that uh, stop AAPI, that's Asian American or um, uh, Asian American Pacific Islander hate, a coalition aimed at addressing the anti-Asian discrimination during COVID-19 pandemic received more than 2,800, and I think this number is now up to 3,100 first-hand reports of anti-Asian hate including physical and verbal assaults between March 19 and December 31st, 2020. Nearly 44% of all the incidents reported to stop AAPI hate have come from California. Asian Americans account for roughly 15% of the 40 million population. So you can see that the number of hate crimes against Asian Americans is widely disproportionate. But so I, so as I said, this caught the uh, this caught the attention of federal government. It caught the attention of uh, President Biden. Uh, it caught the attention of several people, right? So, uh, but you know, so this is what uh, President uh, this is what the report further said that the federal government must recognize this uh, the role that federal government has played. Uh, I believe this is the statement. Uh, just a second. Yeah, this is the, the one that you see uh, in blue. So that is the statement made by President Biden. And he said the federal government must recognize that it has played a role in furthering these xenophobic sentiments through the actions of political leaders. And so, so is obviously, you know, so that he's referring to his predecessor, uh, President Trump. And he's saying that, you know, look, I mean, this is all the previous administration and we should be vigilant. And uh, one of the series of racial equality focused executive orders that President Biden passed, I don't know what it means in real life, but that was uh, basically, you know, uh, that was aimed, uh, that was meant for Asian American. So um, uh, our, our hate against Asian American, right? So. I think that's all good. I, I really think that that's really, you know, uh, President Biden has done it, you know, I, that was the need of the hour and he has done it. Um, and on the right hand side, I see, I you know, displayed for those who wanted some more details about what Karthik Ramakrishnan, who is the founder and director on demographic data and policy research at RP Data, uh, what he directly blamed President Trump for the attacks on Asian American. Okay, all good, okay. Um, you know, that's their opinion. Uh, but so the, there is a, this is a news item that kind of transcends a little politics, right? Because if you look at the report from uh, San Francisco that uh, came out, where uh, they said that there is a spike in the attack against Asian American, especially in past one month. So that there was a change in administration. So I I don't know if any it serves the new administration or Asian American Pacific Island data or advocates like us to blame a political party or a blame a particular political leader. Uh, we, there is an issue here. That issue needs to be addressed by everyone. Uh, Asian Americans cannot be brutally attacked while they're walking down the street or spat upon if they're, and we will come to all of the, all these incidents in a second. But the, the fact that there is, the, the Asian Americans, including Indians, Hindus, are being singled out and are being attacked and harassed in the public sphere in America is not a good thing. And there's really no reason for this to be politicized. And it serves no one to politicize this. Because if you flip this around, and if President, uh, say, was, President Trump was in his first month of presidency, and the number of, uh, and there was a spike on Asian American or any ethnic group, like attack on them, then people would be saying, hey, look, there's a new president, and people, you know, people have now, uh, you know, gotten some kind of, um, in, uh, you know, impunity, without, you know, that they just, you know, go out and attack whoever they want without feeling the pressure of prosecution. So they think that they're newly empowered to go and attack Asian Americans. So we want to transcend all that. We want to really get to the root of the problem. We want to discuss the root of the problem and we have to figure out why this is happening. 
Uh, sir, before I turn it over to you and uh, get your comments on just this part before we go down the list of things that we've identified, I want to show you this one video and I, I want to show this video to you and I don't want to I don't want to make it about uh, race. I don't want to make it about any of that, but I just want to show you this video so that people would know what uh, what kind of um, the what kind of attacks are happening on um, on Asian Americans. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to quickly share this one video that was posted on Twitter, and uh, please let me know when you see it. Uh, so this is the video. It was from Twitter. Uh, let me share the sound, optimize for video clip, and then there we go. Also, the, uh, if you can see my browser screen, uh, please let me know, and I'm going to play this video now. I can I can see it. Hey, yo, fuck the man! <laughs> fuck the man, man, I got corona! Yo, yeah, what's up? Hey, 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 so, so the, like you know, it, 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 same thing continues, and this uh, the women were arrested and all of that, obviously, because uh, first of all they refused to wear the mask, and then after they refused to wear the mask, uh, they started coughing. Uh, in this era of COVID, they actually started coughing on the cab driver who was of Indian origin, a Hindu. So uh, you know, and they uh, you know they damaged this car. It had to be you know things like that, right? So, the, um, what do you make of this? And and we are going to get into those social factors in, at some point of time in our conversation today. But the more important thing that needs to be understood is that that going back to the uh, statements by President Biden, uh, the media needs to come uh, rise to the occasion and ask the question. We understand that you know President Biden thinks that the state the 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 rise in violence is because of uh, you know, statements made by politicians. But if he's going to blame President Trump for statements that were made one year ago, why is the rise in violence happening now after President Biden has been in power for the last two months? So if it was the media that was uh, actually neutral, they would be asking this question. And, and they would be actually uh, analyzing it. Uh, imagine this, uh, flip the situation. If it was a Democratic Party president, and I, you know, I'm not trying to be political here, but I'm just trying to be objective here. If it was flipped and President Biden was the president before and President Trump was the president now, and the violence was happening right now, who do you think everybody would have blamed? President Trump, if he was the president right now. So I th I really think we need to revisit, and it was it's not as much as we need to revisit, but it's the American mainstream media that needs to revisit its own rationales, and be more objective about it. We have to if we are going to deal with uh, any kind of discrimination, any kind of violence, any kind of uh, social uh, actions that cause harm to people, anybody, the first thing we have to do is to be honest about how we represent it and how we deal with it. And uh, I think that is, uh, that is uh, in this particular case, you know, it's, it's spinning, you know, to use a cricketing term, the ball is already spinning before it has left the hand. So, uh, you know, th th there's nothing much you can do with it. Uh, so we're going to analyze this uh, based on multiple dimensions, this problem. And you know that we, we tend to be a little bit more analytic in this show, even though it is a, you know, it's a casual banter and we just have a casual conversation. Our, uh, whatever we present, we generally present um, with a good, um, you know, with a good, uh, you know, uh, you know, evidence behind it. And we look at So that the dimensions along which we are going to analyze this issue is the model minority myth. Uh, that is certainly one act, one dimension. The other is from the American dream perspective. The next one is the economic envy and the role the economic envy plays in this. Uh, and then we'll talk about the othering of Asian Americans and we'll explain what othering means. And we will talk about the white adjacency. 
uh, whatever that means, uh, the whitening of Asian Americans. And finally, we are going to talk about this uh, article that came in Wall Street Journal, which talks about uh, the uh, education uh, the New York City and how New York City is now uh, classifying um, Asians as um, as pretty much as white, whereas the, the same Asians when they go to school, they're being you know not treated quite the same. So multiple dimensions, lot to talk about, and then uh, move on to the other views of the week as well. We have lots to cover with Sudha. So let's start with the first one, and I'll quickly lay the groundwork on the first one and get your view on this one. So so that um, this is the uh, this is the report. Uh, this is about the model minority. You know, for many, uh, I, I think when people look at the economic data, right? And let me show you the economic data. You can see that from 1980, uh, 1988 uh, till today, uh, Asian Americans, um, the median uh, income of Asian Americans is higher than any other ethnic group. Right? So the Asian Americans are considered to be wealthier. Uh, richer than other uh, other groups, um, and this is the uh, this is something that is uh, you know uh, daring. Okay, uh, the the other but but instead of uh, understanding why this has happened, the fact that Asian Americans grow up in mostly in uh, you know uh, two parent families or uh, they have higher education. And because their parents make extra sacrifices uh, so that the children uh, stay ahead in the schools, the parents expect a lot from the uh, children who are in school. There are a lot of other socioeconomic factors that play into that. And it's not the privilege that was handed down to them. I mean, you can think of all the Vietnamese people who came as boat people. Or you, came, uh, you look at all the Indians who came with, with a degree, of course, but mostly, uh, mostly with no money and just a degree and an education. And you can go down the list and you can see that uh, Asian Americans, uh, in despite of all these uh, difficulties, uh, they, have made, uh, they have made quite a bit of progress. So, uh, so that I think, um, uh, so, so you know, it's kind of interesting uh, with this uh, report from USA Today, the slide is from the USA Today report, and um, they are talking about, um, you know that from the from the white perspective, um, the whites have used this model minority a narrative uh, to pit Asians against the people of other colors, and the people of other and Asians are attacked more by people who are non-white. I I don't know if there is a direct correlation. This is based on a report that came from U.S. National Library of Medicine um, that says the second part is from National Library of Medicine, which says the Asian Americans have a relatively higher chance than Blacks or Latinos of experiencing hate crimes perpetrated by non-white. Now, the U.S. Today report, U.S. Today news item says that is because the white have said that they are model minority. I don't know if it might have said that, or is it because the 7-Elevens and uh, uh, you know uh, corner laundry stores are run by Asian Americans and the motels are run by Asian Americans, and that has given the perception. Um, but the fact remains, and yes, I got that part right. The fact remains that despite uh, the report found that despite hate crimes against Asian Americans being on the rise, the studies rarely look at such incidents. So that there's a video that has been played a few million times that happened in 2020, where a Vietnamese American woman went to a Mexican restaurant and someone asked her uh, to sit with that person, a, a man, and have lunch with her. And she said, I'm married, I'm not, you know, I'm not interested, right? And that person went on a diatribe and insulted this woman and uh, really, uh, you know, uh, made uh, you know made her life miserable right there in front of everyone. Nobody came to her rescue. This is the not the end of it. She went to police and she complained. And police said in Los Angeles, police said they cannot do anything about it. Okay, so the, uh, give me your comments on the model minority myth 
and the economic prosperity of Asian Americans before we move on to the other dimensions? Well, you know, all the things that you narrated, uh, they, are, they are after the fact uh, narrations. Um, we have to look at the causes and the, and the influences and the, the storylines that are causing this to happen. You know, what has happened in American politics and for that matter politics in most countries of the world with a lot of diversity is that identity politics has taken over as the, as the main way to garner votes because you know, any diverse country, country that has a lot of people from different parts of the world, you know, America is really one of the most diverse countries in the world. And it continues to uphold its tradition of being an extremely diverse country. But with that comes the challenges of diversity. And part of that challenge is that there is going to be identity politics. And you know, in the recent past that has been encouraged uh, because it helps political parties garner votes. And with that comes grouping of identities. So as we see uh, more and more uh, you know, grouping of people based on economic agendas and economic uh, narrations, people suddenly start questioning the color scheme based narrations and they get into conflict with each other because you know, it's easier to divide people on the color scheme based, you know, which America is extremely good at. You know, they literally sit with a color chart. When I say they, these are the socio-political uh, agenda givers. So they sit with a color chart and start defining people and their agendas. Now you put a layer of economics on top of it and then suddenly it gets scrambled. With all of that, what is happening is that there is messages going out in the society. And this is not something new. This has happened in the past as well in America that you cannot, you, you know, you need to sub discriminate within discriminate and, and you need to create newer identities that identity politics promoters need to further subdivide on so that they can garner the maximum vote. And at the end of the day, the whole messaging gets muddled. Whoever has the loudest voice in the media with at this point of time, we all know who does uh, gets to decide how to present the narrative. And truth is the biggest casualty of this. So in terms of looking at the model minority, uh, uh, whole model minority storyline, it basically says that, look, this is a socialist uh, layering on top of the racial narrative building that America has. And therefore, you know, anybody who, they may be minority, they may be, uh, you know, non-white uh, in America, but hey, you know what? You are rich. So now you don't get anything that the other identity politics players are, are deserving and getting. So now you, you stand at the end of the queue there. Now, what that leads to is that you get the wrong end of both the sticks here. So the pro, you know, white supremacists will have, have you at the wrong end of their stick just, stick just because of the fact that it has been hammered into their narrative building that you are not a white. And the socialist quote unquote, you know, progressive left leaning, I'm using word progressive in under quotes because most of these people are actually not progressive. They have you at the wrong end of the stick just by the fact that you worked hard and you made good life for yourself in the economic aspects of things. So what you see now is an outcome of all these storylines that are being, being built again and again in the media and it, they get enhanced in big time during elections. So every two years, you know, every time there's an election for the House and the Congress and every time there's a presidential election, these layers of messaging are, you know, further built upon and emotions stoked. Of course, votes are there for having, for, for the taking for this, but it causes a social fissure that America right now will not feel it because it's a country that is growing and it has, it's a country that has still got a lot of opportunities for people, for immigrants, for, for people who are working hard. But as America matures as a country and, and, and becomes a you know, old world country, if I can put it that way, it will see the effects of these kinds of society dividing narrative building and it will not be good for America. So it's, you know, all politicians at this point, I would say the Democrats more so, need to revisit their, their narrative building and their storylines because it's affecting real people and their lives. Yeah. 
so the I, I think you uh, you put it so aptly, and I want to I want to share this uh, Wall Street Journal editorial uh, uh, rather op-ed piece with you, and uh, this is uh, this is a really interesting op-ed piece by uh, by Bill McGrone. Uh, and uh, William McGrone, and I'll, I'll uh, let me uh, let me share this with you and see uh, what you have to say about that. Uh, so this is, uh, and uh, let me know when you can see and actually read this uh, because uh, this may be. I want to make sure that the writing is uh, big enough for everyone to read it, not just you. Um, so this is an interesting article again. It's I can so I can see it clearly. Yeah. Perfect. So this is an article. It talks about. It just came out on February twenty second, and it talks about the woke minority model minority myth. For progressives, Asian American achievement is an embarrassment. And so the I you know I I found this article really interesting. Um, it, it's interesting because take a look at this. Um, this is the you know uh, the, uh, the the quality report that came out. Um, from uh, Lacey Washington, and it classified the Asian American along with whites instead of students of color. Now, I was reading this last week a book written by H. V. Shashadri Ji, um, and he uh, was a RSS, uh, you know, uh, lifelong pracharak, one of the you know uh, thought leaders in RSS. And when he came to America the first time, and he narrates this little incident uh, that he where he goes to this, he was staying with a family, and they had a little girl, maybe eight, nine years, ten years old, and uh, uh, she was playing outside, and she came running home and with tears in her eyes, and she told um, she told and her parents asked her, hey, why why are you crying? What happened? And uh, she said, uh, you know, I was. Uh, I, I was playing with my friends, and uh, one of my friends said that you cannot play with us because you are not white. Okay, so this is one uh, reality of Asian uh, Americans, including Hindu Americans, Indian Americans, and this is the other reality where uh, a school district classifies them um, as student of color, and in this particular case, they are classified as white because they are doing too well. Instead of, as I said a little earlier, right about five minutes ago, that instead of going into why they are doing well and how other communities can emulate something good, learn out of it, uh, the fact that uh, you know Asian Americans sacrifice, the parents sacrifice a lot for their kids to get education. Asian American kids have no, uh, you know, uh, not as many co-curricular, extracurricular activities. They sacrifice sports. They single-mindedly focus on studies, and it is no different than a, you know a good. Uh, Um, a good artist, a good painter, because I don't take sports and other analogies, but a good artist. If you realize that your kid is gifted in music, and then you put all the effort in music, uh, or if you and if your kid is a, like a good, a good, a good athletic ability, you put all the other, uh, you put all effort into athletic ability. And if your kid has nothing going for uh, for him or her, they are not tall enough to play basketball. They are not strong enough to play football. They are not, they are not gifted enough to be a great musician or artist. Then the parents say, "Hey, you know what? Sit and study, because at least you'll have a decent middle class living." Right, that is what Asian Americans do to their kids. They expect a lot, and they say excel because the world that they came from was not fair. Equal opportunities were not available to everyone, and so parents have learned the hard way that the only way out and economically economically prosper is really. To excel in education, so they put everything in education in education, and then they come across this barrier. And Asian Americans doing well economically, be showing color. After a district said was overwhelming public vote, they finally said that the category choices had racist implication, and then they dropped the equity report. And this is what the term: uh, if you are from India or China, because you are doing well, you are considered. White adjacent, or as one of the high school kids we were talking to, so that you and I were both talking to uh, this past week, said, "Or oh, they're called whitewashed, right?" Uh, so, okay. so I wanted to say some things. Uh, yeah, please, on this please go ahead. So, so what is interesting about this is that uh, you are basically uh, undermining success in this this uh, storyline, and I think that is becoming a. a 
a mainstream trend in America in recent times because anybody who is and the irony here is that many of these people Asian Americans are actually coming from societies that not more than three generations ago were colonized so you know the, it's not like they're coming coming from uber privilege of any sort in in fact quite the opposite so but you know this is what happens in identity politics that it's all about siloing people into small groups so that you can deal with each of them separately and and use one against the other as a way of garnering votes and i think this is devolving american you know america is devolving into this vote bank politics uh, society and the saddest part here is that there is a huge huge intellect, intellectual uh, uh, core group out there you know that many a times controls universities has has good voice in hollywood has good a very powerful voice in the media think tanks they are very much in this narrative because it doesn't affect them directly yet so they they are perpetuating this uh, as much as they can and you know i don't there is another interesting point i wanted to ma- mention which would you know make this report very very relevant in california last year uh, i think it was university of berkeley which actually came out with a report which said that immigrants from sudan or ethiopia one of the two countries are actually white based on their privilege uh, you know status or they did some study so you know it's the, the, the whole definition of what race means is also flipping around here and and the people you know there will be a time when somebody who you know who is white will declare themselves black <laughs> and get away with it and <laughs> you know that's how warped this whole storyline is becoming and that's how it's dangerous but people in america don't seem to understand this and uh, i don't know what the implications of that will be and also the you know the sad part is that we have seen this movie before yes uh, and the society has been uh, so uh, finely uh, you know uh, divided it, it is impossible for people of that country to come together and be cohesive and you know and and really prosper everyone prospering together um if you look at the reservations in india and look i would be the first to say because i have seen it first hand that it, it, no society including indian society is made of equals there is discrimination in india uh, of all kinds there are you know there are discrimination uh, based on uh, you know you name it criteria right in india and so indian uh, government uh, constitutionally had certain amount of uh, quota that they set aside in education in jobs and and it was justified in 1947 and then more and more groups started demanding this quota and more and more politicians started uh, you know dividing up this quota within quota to give quota to other people and and the sad part is so there is the people who ended up benefiting out of it are the people who in india people call creamy layer the people who are already doing well because they had enough political power and they ended up uh, you know uh, consuming most of these quotas so i think and and at the end of the day what india could have achieved in 20 30 years of independence it has taken india almost 70 years and we are still not there in india and it's going to and only because of the present government uh which is trying to rise above this narrow mindedness of all kinds of societal division and trying to unite india based on its ancient principles that country is finally coming together but as it may be let's continue on this wall street journal report it said and this is this of course you know uh, mayor of new york bill de blasio um, uh, came across this uh, you know uh, engineered this report uh, called the secret shame and you can see the name of the report here uh, the secret shame and saying that in that report it said that the black and latino children have been falling behind and look again numbers are numbers right so black and latino the studies find that the black and latino students are falling behind then there is a real need to understand why 
Is it because of the family structure? Is it because early education is not there? Like, you know, pre-K education, kindergarten education, K-4 education. Uh, where are the, you know, are there, uh, you know, are there school lunch programs that are sufficient to feed all the kids who are coming to New York City schools? There's so many dimensions to that. So instead of looking at that, taking a classic communist approach that you bring down everyone to the lowest common denominator does not work for the society. We tried that. The humanity tried that in Soviet Union. It did not work. And look what he's saying. It's like, abolish the entrance exam for the city's gifted and challenged program because even though Asian Americans are 17%, 42% of Asian Americans are qualifying through these exams. I, I wanted to say something, stop you for a moment there and say yeah, something about sure. the Soviet model which you mentioned. Yeah. Look, the, even the Soviet Marxists, Soviet communists, they started off by bringing everybody down to the lowest common denominator, as you noted, which these people love to do, the progressives love to do in America. Irony here is that even the Soviet Union realized after 10, 15 years, that they need special schools and special uh, talents uh, set up for people who they think are more gifted. So if you, I don't know how many people here are are, are from the time when you know they remember stories from East Germany and from, from the Warsaw Pact countries, but it would be very interesting for young people in America who, who are uh, into progressive politics and for good reasons. I mean, there are many good things to talk about in that as well. They need to go back and revisit what the socialists in Russia and, and East Germany and all these places did. Uh, they will be surprised that in East Germany, kids at the age of four were picked out and separated so that people who the state felt were smarter, were given a different quality of education with different skill sets than the people who the state thought was not as smart and belonged to. So this kind of uh, segregation in education even the Soviet Union had to had done it because they at some point realized that bringing everybody down to the lowest common denominator actually doesn't work and their society is going to collapse, which it eventually did. But, you know, so, you know, it, it, it is important for our friends who are in all spectrums of the sociopolitical uh, ideological spectrum in America, they need to study uh, other parts of the world where these things have not worked and maybe even look at things that work and, you know, one of the things about America that attracts people to America is the free society and the competition that is there in this country. If we, if we stop bringing a free competitive environment, uh, then America will eventually not be America anymore. And I think some people are working very, very hard to do that. And uh, you will not be surprised if you see other parts of the world gaining uh, gaining much economic much more economic strength and and intellectual capabilities over the next couple of decades and and, and this is not just new york i mean like you can see here i've highlighted the san francisco's renowned Rawal high school also abolished merit bed admission because asian americans were qualifying at a much higher rate and then if you go down in this article uh, you know, it makes some good points, right? It says that uh, it, it gives out a wrong message uh, that the, uh, you know, the strong work ethics in America, that in America, as long as, you know, the, the, in America, if you work hard, you can achieve things. And that is the promise of America that brought uh, a lot of the Asians uh, to America, including uh, Indians and Hindus, and it also brought a lot of Chinese and Vietnamese and Koreans and all of them to America. Because you know, it brought everybody. You know, I, let, let me tell you, it brought people from Africa to America. It brought people from South America to America. It brought everybody to America with that promise. That's why you will see that even they, within people of color communities, as I'm calling it based on the popular narrative here, there is a division now. There is a division where immigrants within the people of color community are also feeling hurt by this narrative. I mean, somebody who has come to America from South America also has come from the, for the same dreams that there will be success based on, on merit and, and, and hard work. Somebody coming from Africa. So it's not just Asian Americans who, who have these kinds of ethical uh, expectations. It is people from all parts of the world. I think where we are going wrong is somewhere within America. And somewhere after people have come here and have lived here for generations and they are falling into political storytelling 
and that's what we have to look after it's not just you know it's not coming from immigrant populations and their value system it's coming from a value system that is getting promoted within america especially in the campuses and universities and so called pro- progressive state places yeah and then you know it's really uh, it's really uh, i highlighted a couple of things that i you know uh, in the past it says the uh, asian anti asian bigotry bigotry took the form of direct assaults uh but now it is you know it's a lot more right and it's saying that asian america uh, but today many asian americans are learning that progressive form of discrimination may be the most insidious of all and if you go down I, it says that really um, uh you know what should asian americans uh, tell uh, their kids should they tell them that hey accept this suck it up and live or do they tell them that hey look you know uh you know, uh, you know uh, bring about the change i i tell you so the i i tell my son that you know obviously we want equality obviously we want uh, we want everyone to be treated fairly and we don't want to suddenly do i don't uh, don't want to deprive anyone of fair chances but i also tell him that look you are a nation american and your fate in america is that you have to work harder than any other uh, any other ethnicity and you have to work harder because the the opportunities that you have you have to fight harder to avail of the opportunities that you have uh, your life is not going to be easy uh, and so i i tell my son that you uh, if other people are giving 100% uh, because you are asian american i you know uh, the Uh, you know uh, unless and until the things change work 125% hard uh, no don't work don't put in 100% because as a nation you have to so that the reason i say that is because i also want to show you this one thing uh, here and that is uh, the other part of it right so so that before i uh, while we explain this slide uh, tell everyone what is othered because that is a term that a lot of people who are in our audience may not know about what is othered or what is othering so othering is again it's an outcome of identity based uh, uh, storytelling uh, it is basically when you create a social subgroup that is ide- ideologically in conflict for for whatever number of reasons you can you can list the reasons you know for history for for color skin color or whatever uh with somebody else so therefore they are not part of the 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 group that that is doing it and othering has is it's a historical uh you know it starts with uh, revealed uh, belief systems i must say you know there is the believer and the non believer so it it starts from there goes back 3000 years 2000 years and and othering is is has been a historical phenomena it's how uh, humanity unites and divides at the same time uh i i will probably coin a new term it has become it is micro othering now that is that is happening in america uh, you know previously it was the believer and the non believer believer othering that was uh, the global phenomena at least in big parts of the world you know uh, so- social belief system religious schools of thoughts had that now it's a different kind of othering it's i, I would say it, it's micro othering where you know the the the, uh, the curliness of your hair uh, could be the cause for othering the 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 you know type of work you do the othering is happening at at many different levels again an outcome of of politics that is driven by identity uh, uh, that is very popular in america now Uh, so the, you know i i saw this and i said hey look harvard is you know uh, harvard is taking a very you know pro uh, asian stand here and the harvard crimson crimson is writing an article about the othering and the exclusion exclusion of asian american and then in the same year so that uh, there was a you know there was a federal lawsuit against harvard for its uh, discrimination in admission uh, against uh, asian americans including chinese indians koreans vietnamese filipinos etc and this is what harvard was uh, you know harvard was doing um and so the writing of asian like the atlantic uh, had uh, you know quoted this harvard's own internal research division and found that if the admission in harvard was fair 43% of admitted class would have been asian american okay but then harvard 
a supposedly a fair and just institution that is so concerned about, so they're so concerned about the othering and exclusion of Asian Americans. And they added other factors such as legacy students, athletics, extracurricular activities that generally exclude Asians, Asian Americans. Okay. If you apply those criteria, the Asian American uh, admissions at Harvard would go down to 26%, okay? Not good enough for Harvard. Not good enough for Harvard. So I note that. Not good enough for Harvard. So what do they do? They then go and apply the te a test of, like, what is the personality type? And what is the demographic? So they, like, how does this person, uh, you know, uh, present himself or herself? Very subjective, right? And then they apply the demographic factors. And they, then they apply that, so that the number of Asian Americans fall to 18%, okay? from 44%, if it was a just and fair system, Asian Americans are down to 18%. And yet, uh, the New York Department of Education sponsored groups say that Asian, uh, Asians benefit from white privilege. Okay, so this, okay. So now my question for you, Tsuda is, um, my question for you here is, what is an Asian American kid to do? You go out to a playground and uh, you know what's going on. Someone is using the handle. What's uh, going on? Uh, is saying the same thing that in Illinois there's a state uh, there's a parking subdivision. Then whites uh, you know uh, and uh, Asians don't play together um, for whatever reason uh, for discrimination reasons. So whatever it is, right? So and I told you I narrated the story of this little girl. Um, so on one hand, the Asian Americans are not really included in one categorization of race, and they're not, a not included in the other categories on the race. They've been spat upon or coughed upon by both sides. They've been pushed off the railway platform. They're being killed in a bar. Uh, they're for, you know, uh, so, so basically, uh, you know, Asian Americans, including Indians, including Hindus, are in this position where they're getting beat up from all sides. What are they to do? And you're like, you know, we are barely 3-4% of the population. Correct. So, you know, there is, there is little that can be done in this uh, environment except uh, throw light on truth. Because I think, you know, what I have observed historically is that uh, social realities eventually have a way of figuring themselves out uh, and, and resolving themselves because you know, social realities are based on, on, on competitive uh, social, uh, social movements. And uh, in that it's, it is at some point, you know, truth comes out. So this kind of, uh, this kind of false uh, othering and false uh, identity politics will continue on for some time before it, uh, it reveals itself and it starts unraveling. And that is going to, uh, it's, it's unfortunate that probably a generation of American young, young men and women will be suffering because of it. Uh, most of them Asian Americans, but eventually society will figure itself out. And I, I'm a big believer in that. The, the more important aspect here is for people to actually use, focus on truth, focus on, on and bring, focus on bringing positive equality to the society. So, I mean, that, fact needs to be underlined many times over. You know, the, the, the easiest way to, to other anybody is to dismiss their truth. And, and I think that is, that's the larger ideological conversation that uh, we have to offer to the society as Hindu Americans, uh, because othering is the easiest thing to do. And it is also the easiest way to divide people and, and bring your own quote unquote tribe together, well, however you define it define it on the color of the color chart basis or economic basis, or, but it will not last. Eventually it will break up and everybody will suffer. So I, I, you know, I cannot underline the fact more than the fact that we need to have truth 
be brought to light and i think hindu americans have a good role in in that but uh, so so that with that uh, we uh, we conclude uh, this particular uh, segment of the uh, of the of the show and i think i think i, th uh, I think uh, we uh, you know I, i think we should be hopeful that in america uh, you know these things have in general a way of working itself out through dialogue uh, through court system through legislation and through education and i remain eternally hopeful that we in america will uh, work it out so with that utsada i want to uh, i want to close this uh, this particular segment and i want to uh, i want to move on to uh, some other news so utsada so the next item is i let you speak to this because this is your favorite item and i'm hoping that uh, maya durga will uh, let you speak on this because this is uh, this is your item so maya let your dad speak so tell us about this conference so well this is a conference uh, of uh, women of dharma which is uh, women of from hindu and and other dharmic Thank communities you. uh both uh, uh, sikh and uh, jaina communities largely part of the sanatan dharma hindu identity uh so this conference is being organized uh, by uh, a, a hindu organization uh, and it is amazing uh, because uh, i wanted to highlight i highlighted the part where sonal shah a leading member of the american hindu community uh, who used to be part of world hindu council of america uh, not many not too long ago uh, she is a keynote speaker but guess who else is speaking here uh, and that's why this item made it to the news it's going to be congresswoman pramila jaypal on equity for women of dharma so you know pramila jaypal was in the news over the last year for her her actions and statements and uh, and resolutions uh, that she sponsored that literally was aimed at bringing misery to big chunks of the hindu populations in other parts of the world uh, and in america to some extent uh, but here we have her speaking at the uh, inaugural message of the equity for women for dharma uh, by this organization so i am looking at it positively i don't know how everybody else is looking at it but uh, maybe she has uh, seen some enlightenment or uh, or maybe she's just using it as a stepping stone to to make herself look good again uh, either way i think it's any form of engagement in my opinion is good engagement and uh, i hope it you know brings out better uh, better out of her you know and for the community the hindu community yeah i i think it's so we we remain um, eternally optimistic and um you know i think uh, maybe maybe sonal will bring pramila jaypal around and maybe sonal will make uh, pramila jaypal realize that her hindu roots her dharmic roots uh, I, she don't want to use the word hindu okay the Dh dharmic roots are uh, you know uh, are something that uh, she needs to uh, you know come back to and um, it, it will make for a better uh, pramila jaypal in future you know i you know we remain we remain as always the sada we remain optimistic and we are cheering this time for the first time on the show let's let's cheer uh, pramila jaypal sonal certainly has the capability to do that uh, we hope she does uh, you know, welcome home ghar wapsi for pramila jaypal you know ghar wapsi is a big concept right now hopeful ghar wapsi i would qualify it so that so that let's be optimistic come on um and and we should offer uh, pramila while we are at it uh, you know if you have a shuddhikaran ceremony for pramila jaypal uh, for a communist who is coming back home i mean we should offer that for free to her too uh <laughs> meditation class meditation uh, yeah, 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 yeah. let's let's offer her a free meditation class and uh, you know a class on yoga meditation and uh, you know welcome her back i i'm 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 very proud of her uh attempts uh, and efforts in coming back to the hindu fold uh hopefully she'll you know uh, she'll see our way on issues ranging from uh, kashmir 
to uh, CA and uh, all the other things. I mean, like this, I, I, you know, she's powerful. She has a big voice in Congress. Like, absolutely. Well, so now with that, uh, we come to the uh, we come to the next, uh, you know, next big thing on our show, and let's have a drum roll for that. Uh, and a drum roll. What is it? Here we go. Good news of the week. So uh, I brought out something that make you happy because you grew up in Madhya Pradesh, right? Look, names are changing in Madhya Pradesh. You grew up in Bhopal? Yes, I did. I did. I did. No, no, Bhopal is now Bhojpal. And Idga Hills and Obadila Ganj and Begum Ganj and all of them are now Changing names. Look at this. So, so hall is no longer Minto Hall. So, so uh, I, I don't. You haven't shared the screen, so I don't see oh, it yet. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, you know, I got so excited about this that I found some good news that would uh, make you happy, and I forgot to share the screen. So there we go. So that. Uh, so you know, someday we should have this uh, conversation on on the history of Bhopal. Uh, or Bhojpal, uh, as I should call it now. Yes, because, please. Because Bhojpal, uh, you know, it's a, a fascinating place and uh, one of the most understated uh, regions of the Indian subcontinent when it comes to its history. And, uh, you know, I did not appreciate it as a kid growing up, but Bhojpal was one of the largest artificially man-made created water bodies. It's because, you know, uh, for those of us who are from the Indian subcontinent, uh, if you know that region, it is an arid region. It's not very, uh, doesn't get much rain, but you know, more than a, uh, close to almost 1800 years ago, there was a man-made artificial lake that was created to provide water supply, which is one of the largest irrigation projects in the world for those days. You know, even the Roman empire and, and, and the construction work aqueducts that were built by the Romans, would pale in, in comparison to the scale of these projects that were done 1800 years ago. But un unfortunately, like so many things in our part of the world, the history of Bhojpal has been forgotten. And it's named after the, the great king, uh, a, a very famous Hindu king named Raja Bhoj, uh, a, a connoisseur of art and architecture and beautiful work that is still in ruins in many outskirts of Bhojpal. So, as a student of architecture, I studied this a little bit, uh, but as also somebody who oh, who is uh, children of colonized people, I didn't give enough appreciation to it. So hopefully, once I am I am economically rich enough to go back to my 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 part of the world where I come from, I will probably write a book about it as an architect. Uh, I probably will be qualified to do it, and uh, I really hope uh, you know something good comes out of this. So, so uh, our compliments to uh, Shiraj Chavar. Uh, so that there is a second good news of the, uh, of the week. And that is, uh, if you recall, uh, there was a legislation in uh, New York on swastika. And a lot of Hindu organizations got together. Um, uh, Kona played a very significant role in that. Uh, you know, uh, we were part of uh, some of the meetings of the legislation as Hindu Pact and AHAD as well. But Kona really took a lead, and uh, and that legislation has now been, uh, you know, basically put to rest. It's not going to pass. And I think uh, it is a still there were uh, you know, maybe over a dozen Hindu organizations were together on this. Um, and I participated in a couple of meetings with the uh, state uh, state senators. Um, but, you know, so I, I want to give, out, uh, give a shout out to uh, Nikunj Trivedi, who did a great job on this, and other people um, who were involved. Uh, Dr. Raj Bayani was one of the people involved as well. And I think uh, you know it shows that when Hindus come together, um, a lot can be achieved. And I think uh, that is a compliment to the Hindu community. Uh, so that I, unless you have any comment on this, I'd like to move on to the Hindu Seva Charity Act of the Week. So can I move on to that? Yes, yes, abs absolutely, please. So, so that let me uh, start by, you know, as we go there, let me share another screen. And this time I want to have a theme music 
for Hindu Seva Charity Act of the Week. It's a 15 second or so uh, clip. And I just want to, you know, and I, I, this time it is this clip, next time it may be a different clip. And eventually we'll settle on a, settle on a uh, theme for all our segments. So this is the theme this week for Hindu Seva Act of the Week before you introduce the subject. Lokahitam Mamakaraniyam. We are, we have good thoughts in our mind, we do good actions, and we help other people. Tell us about so, the Hindu Seva Act of the Week. So I think this week and next week will be, uh, uh, will be very important uh, uh, for in some ways because uh, we are going to focus uh, starting this week onwards on uh, a very important event in human uh, history, especially for American Hindus, because uh, not more than 50 years ago, uh, 2.8 million Hindus were killed in a genocide in what was East Pakistan and now currently Bangladesh. And so Human Rights Congress for minority, uh, Bangladesh Minorities, which is a 501c3 nonprofit that has a special consultative status at the United Nations uh, uh, Civil Societies uh, Organization Group, ECOSOC, uh, which is very rare, actually not, I don't know of any Hindu organization that has it. Uh, so it's very important to support Human Rights Congress for Bangladesh Minorities. Uh, it is an organization that was started in 2001 and they are hosting an event on March 20th at the, uh, and you can register, you can see the link below. It's tinyurl.com slash UN event HRCBM. And as you can see on the screen, uh, and you will be able to hear their presentation focused on the genocide, uh, uh, on the status of women actually in Bangladesh and the, and the minority women and the, and the suffering they face. Uh, but, but HRCBM is also organizing an event on a 25th of March and, and they are going to do a car rally uh, that will culminate in front of the Pakistan embassy uh, protesting against the genocide and the non-action of Pakistan as well as the world community on the military uh, military leadership. You know, those days they were military young officers who perpetrated a genocide. And, and uh, I think next week we will talk about it most likely. Uh, but it is important that we support organizations like HRCBM because they have been doing the work on educating people and bringing out action on the sufferings of the Hindu community especially in, in Bangladesh in this case. And, and I cannot underline the fact that they need your support. Uh, they represent us all and want to be the people, they, they should be the people who need, who need the support. So uh, very, very, very well put. I hope that uh, uh, everyone uh, goes, out, uh, goes out and supports Human Rights Congress for Bangladesh Minorities. I think that is, uh, you know, uh, while you're at it, so the, why don't you plug next week's program as well? Because it's, uh, it's in line with uh, the, uh, you know, uh, it's in line with what you just mentioned. So we are going to do a special in the lounge next week. Uh, tell us about it. So next week we would be uh, doing a special coverage on uh, the 50th anniversary of uh, the, I won't use the word anniversary, but commemoration uh, of the genocide that was done in Bangladesh by the, the, those days East Pakistan in 1971. It, it started on March 25th uh, in a military operation that the Pakistani army started called Operation Searchlight in which Pakistani army as well as Islamists uh, from Jamaat Islami, Muslim Brotherhood linked organization, they went around Bangladesh and killed more than 2.8 million Hindus and 3 million Bengalis, many of whom were Muslims as well, who opposed the Islamists. Uh, and this is important because it's the 50th year and we need to bring attention to it globally. Uh, there is 
quite a bit of awareness about the Armenian genocide, which happened a hundred years ago in the Armenian community, as well as around the world. Uh, Holocaust, of course, one of the most tragic events of the last hundred years, you know, young Jewish Americans, Jewish people around the world understand and know, know about it. But Hindus don't really know much about the genocide that they suffered 2.8 million people in just 50 years ago. And, you know, I would like to hear from people who are listening to this, uh, how many of their kids or how many of they themselves have spoken about this and how, how much does the 2.8 million Hindu lives lost in 1971 live in the consciousness of average Hindus around the world? Uh, ask your kid if they know about it, if you do already. So these are things that we will cover next next week in our show. It's going to be a special on, on the genocide in 1971. Thank you, Sudha. And Sudha, with that, we come to the final segment of the week, and that is the Hindu phobe of the week. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Ajay Bhai. This time you take care of it. No, so uh, this is this is something that I would like you to go over because Alabama House, good news, right? They ended 18-year-old ban on yoga in public schools. So why is that Hindu fault of the week? Because the fact that it was a ban it, to begin with it, it was it highlights the absolute impact of uh, you know radicalization, radicalized uh, Christian identity politics in America. And, uh, but the, the reason it's this week's uh, Hindu for the week is because although this news is made to look like it's a positive news because there is an end of ban on yoga, the fact that Alabama house actually had to ban the word namaste shows the level of bigotry. Uh, the, the, I mean, for most Hindus who listen to us, I hope they understand the meaning of the word namaste. Uh, if you have to ban a greeting that comes from the, from the bottom of your heart, literally, you know, from your soul to another soul, <laughs> with no mention of the word Hindu, no mention of the word Bhagavad Gita or Vedas or anything in it. It's just a word, you have to ban the word namaste because your religion is threatened by it. Uh, I think they need to question their own religion, uh, whatever that is, who are doing this. And I think it, that's why it is the Hindu foe of the week, uh, uh, you know, I think. <laughs> so with that, we come to the end of um, our episode number 45. I, I want to tell everyone that this was, that you've been watching and listening to Hindu Lounge. Hindu Lounge is brought to you by Hindu Pack. Hindu Pack is the Hindu Policy Research and Advocacy Initiative or Collective of World Hindu Council of America, VHPA. Uh, Utsada, our co host, is the executive director of Hindu Pack. And I, with him, I am Ajay Shah. I am the president of World Hindu Council of America. We come to you live every Sunday at 11 o'clock Eastern and we talk about contemporary American Hindu issues. And with that, Utsada, keep the streaming on. We will play the entire uh, special uh, music that was created just for episode number 45 by uh, Padma and Bharat Jairaman. An awesome, awesome uh, uh, music piece. And they are, you know, they do this, uh, you know, amazing work uh, creating this music for us. So with that, Utsada, I wish you and all our viewers the best of the coming week. And I, uh, and I will see you again next week. Namaste, and please, everybody. Uh, namaste. And I want to say namaste to all our friends in Alabama. And I hope they say namaste as well. <laughs> and, and please tell uh, Maya Durga, who, before even she learns to speak, she has learned how to do namaste. So uh, with that, Sona, I want to, uh, uh, let's come to an end for this, uh, this show. And I will, we will see everyone again uh, next week. And here we go with the extra music once again by Bharat and Padma Jairaman.